Vice President Kamala Harris said we should be scrutinizing the backgrounds of individuals before they can purchase a firearm. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? I think she's on to something. Gun violence is the number one killer of the children of America. And we can do something about it. When I was speaking with these young leaders before I walked in here, they were talking about, hey, shouldn't we be looking at people's backgrounds before they can buy a gun? I said to them, you are absolutely right, because that's reasonable, that you might want to know before someone could buy a lethal weapon if they have been proven by a court to be a danger to themselves or others. You just might want to know. You're listening to The Q Podcast. I'm your host, Kiana Canada. And this is where we delve into pressing issues that demand our attention. Vice President Kamala Harris declared earlier this week that gun violence stands as the foremost threat to the lives of American children. Harris emphatically urged immediate action, emphasizing a proactive approach by scrutinizing the backgrounds of those responsible for this alarming action. So I decided to follow the White House's lead by doing something about it. And that's by looking at those who were put in positions to serve and to protect us. So statistics show that police have been violent against young black girls. So we're gonna get to that in our first segment. And this sheds light on this deeply concerning trend So according to recent reports, uh, this attack on black girls by police have sparked outrage, highlighting the need for a critical examination of the issue. According to the Marshall Project, black youths make up the majority of kids on the receiving end of police violence. And a striking number of them are girls. Can you believe that? A striking number of the demographic on the receiving end of police violence are girls. Now, almost 800 of the children and teens, roughly a fifth of the total, were black girls. So you can see that that is, you know, a large percentage. And and it's not comparable to boys, and we'll get into that uh, in a a later segment, but uh, right now we can see that white girls were involved in about 120 cases, representing only 3% of use of force incidents. So the Marshall Project uh, compiled a list of country, uh, excuse me, a list of states And it found that Chicago, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, Portland, Oregon were the places where girls experienced force by police uh, at a disproportionate rate in that these girls were overwhelmingly black. So this raises a question, why do American police prey on black girls? So let's let's uncover this. Let's let's get into this. So a 2017 study by the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality found that adults often see black girls as older and less innocent than white girls of the same age. And this could explain why there is a lot uh, there there is a significant amount of attack tax on black girls within the United States is because 
police are not looking at black girls as innocent and as child, um, you know, as children. They're, they are viewing them as adults. So it makes it easier for them to uh, get into confrontations and conflicts with these young girls, which is just disheartening in my opinion. But it doesn't stop there. Let's shift our focus to young uh, black boys and that in this segment, we're gonna delve into instances of police violence against them. It's evident that both genders face unique challenges and understanding these distinctions is vital. But let's get into some alarming statistics. So the Marshall Project found nearly 4,000 youngsters, 17 and under, experienced police violence from 2015 through 2020. More than 2,200 black boys were involved in use of force incidents in the six cities that were examined. 2,200. Now, not only are children getting, in, not only are police officers getting into confrontations with young children and brutalizing young children, but they are also sending young children to the hospital. So evidence ha has shown that children both so we have boys and girls are being brutalized by police and, and, and ending up in hospitals. And the physical and psychological toll on these young lives is just devastating. According to an article, almost 16,000 children and teens went to the hospital after interacting with law enforcement. Just think about it when we're talking about teens, we're talking about individuals 18 years and, and uh, you know, younger than that, that are interacting with police. And children are suffering in the United States because of police. 16,000 went to the hospital, 16,000. The Washington Post has a different set of statistics from the time it published its article in 2021. 112 people younger than the age of 18 were, so not, okay, let's, let's, uh, you know, compartmentalize this. We have a portion of our children within the United States that are being brutalized and sent to the hospital. So they're being injured by police. Now we have, a statistic that, that shows that 112 teens have been fatally shot by police. And it doesn't stop there. So our final segment confronts this harsh truth that police are in some cases the aggressor and are killing children in the United States. We'll discuss the gravity of this situation, the accountability mechanisms in place, and what steps need to be taken to, pre to prevent, in my opinion, further tragedies. But the Equal Justice Initi Initiative identified all adolescents between ages 12 and 17 died from firearm injuries due to police intervention. And this was between 2003 and 2018. And what they did was they compared this to rates uh, of deaths across racial and ethnic groups based on the U.S. Census Bureau data. So they took, again, this number, compared it to rates of these deaths across racial and uh, ethnic groups. And they, uh, I think that they pulled this from the U.S. Census data. And what they found was during a 16 year study period, 140 children died from police intervention. And of those, 113 involved firearms. So now we have a number where there is 140 children that have died 
from police coming in and uh, creating more conflict than what was there. And in out of the 140 cases, 113 children died by a firearm. And let's put let's go deeper into these statistics. So about 93% of children killed were boys with an average age of 16. So you can kind of unpack this to see that not only are police in the United States attacking young black girls who make up a majority of uh, those female incidents, but black boys are being attacked as well. And they're, the percentage is greater for, for black boys. So if you don't believe me, we can go into uh, more data and that shows that victims were disproportionately black and Hispanic. So you have 37% were black and 25% of these fatalities were Hispanic, respectively compared with 13 and 18% of the US population. So blacks make up 13% of the US population, but yet they can, uh, black youths can comprise of 37% of the fatalities, uh, 37% of individuals killed by police. And then you have Hispanics who make up 18% of US population, but comprise of 25% of individuals that, that are being uh, unalive by law enforcement officers in the United States. Further, uh, we have data from Mapping Police Violence, which tracks police killings of children back to 2013, counts up to 175 fatalities of people younger than the age of 18, including three one-year-olds. Can you believe it? Three one-year-olds. This is just, it's saddening. It is saddening. Now, again, I'm following Kamala Harris's, Vice President Kamala Harris's lead. And I, I wanna do something about it. I wanna stop this from happening. And I think that, yeah, let's look at the background. Let's, let's start there. So this is, now we have background evidence here. We have background information on how children are dying uh, at the hands of firearms. And we have a culprit, we have police. So what we can do is we can call for accountability and justice. And that is by repealing the qualified immunity doctrine. This would promote accountability within law enforcement, by holding individual officers responsible for their actions. What this also does is, sh is that this shift would ensure that victims of misconduct or rights violations have a fair chance at seeking justice. And essentially it fosters a system where law enforcement officers are more mindful of the consequences of their actions. Second, trust in community relations. By abolishing the qualified immunity doctrine, I believe that what this does is it helps rebuild trust between law enforcement that are seeking to serve and protect and the communities that they are serving and protect. So we have law enforcement who really, law enforcement officers who really do seek to serve and protect. And then we have a group that just want to commit violence and atrocities against the American people. And qualified by abolishing the qualified immunity doctrine, what that would do is that that would uh, differentiate between 
those officers that are serving and protecting all communities between the officers that just wants that just seeks to be in the police force because they want to commit atrocities and by dem demonstrating a commitment to transparency and fairness the repeal would signal that no one is above the law and it would help to bridge the gap between citizens and the police that genuinely seek to serve and protect. And again, what this ultimately does is it fosters healthier relationships and cooperation. Last and not least, professional standards of training. Now, not only should we abolish the qualified immunity doctrine, but we should have a professional standard of training that emphasizes de-escalation techniques. And this actually could lead to a more prof proficient and responsible police force, reducing the likelihood of civil rights violations and improving overall public safety. Now on my website, I outline uh, that a department that the United States could create is one that is focusing on de-escalation and I will link that in the description, excuse me, the description. And I, I certainly feel that if the United States funneled some of its resources into creating a de-escalation department, that the statistics would decrease tremendously. They would decrease tremendously. Now, again, I am standing with Vice President Kamala Harris in identifying the background. That's what she said that we should do. We should look at the background. This, this podcast did it. We have statistics. And the statistics are showing that majority of police, uh, majority of children that are being unalive, they're being unalive by law enforcement in the United States. Now, do we want these individuals to have a firearm? The answer to that question is no, we don't want those individuals to have a firearm. We want them out of the police force and we want safer communities and the way that we create safer communities is getting these rogue officers out of the police force and, and putting them behind jail. Like Vice President Kamala Harris said, yeah, I want to know. You might want to know. And I think that we all want to know. We all want to know who's policing our communities. We all want to know who is coming into our communities with a firearm. We all, we all want to know if our children are safe. And from the statistics, the statistics that have, uh, that we've gone through during, uh, during this segment, it certainly demonstrates that one of the perpetrators of, uh, firearms against children is police. And I think that the Biden administration can start there. The Biden administration can start fixing things from there. They have the power. They said that they can do something about it. Start there. Thank you for joining us on this crucial episode of the Q podcast, the issues surrounding police violence against young black girls and boys demands our attention. And by fostering open discussions, we hope to contribute to positive change. Remember, change starts with awareness and collective action. Be safe out there. See you next time.